Well, hello there, listeners. Welcome to Humming Fools. <laughs> a fort uh, is terrible. Um, a fortnightly podcast and amateur auditory guide hosted by nobodies and dedicated to the artists, dreamers, or anyone out there with the creative urge. I am one of your nobodies and idiots after what you just heard, Kyle Stuke. And later on, I will be joined by my co-host, my spoon buddy, one of my best friends, I said it, and my knight in shining armor, Noah Bosley. Honestly, he's a lot of other things to me as well, but to put it quite frankly, it's none of your business. It's private. Um, and later on, besides Noah, we will also be visited by our guest today, Liam McCormick, a musician and the frontman and founder of the orchestral indie rock band, The Family Crest, which is honestly, guys, in my top five bands of all time for contemporary artists. Um, they are extremely delicious, extremely tasty, uh, but I will save more fangirling for later because you, that happens in the interview. So you don't need to hear it again here. But I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this interview. We talk about a lot of interesting things, how the band was formed, the way songs are made, um, the interesting new implications technology is having on people's vocal cords, what it's like to perform at an NPR Tiny Desk concert, um, and lots of other really fun stuff. But um, some quick housekeeping before we get to the interview. Thank you for your patience. Um, I just want to say hello to all our returning listeners. Um, you guys are delicious and objectively attractive, and I love you. Thank you for continuing to hang out with us. And if you're a new listener, you are also objectively attractive, and I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us on our little corner of the internet. Um, if you like what you hear today, which hopefully you do, um, we got a lot of other interviews. We've been doing this for a while. We do interviews and we also do discussion episodes. So um, feel free to check out the backlog of other, um, excuse me, <laughs> of other things that we have. Uh, if you're new here, you'll quickly discover that I have trouble talking, which is problematic for someone who hosts a podcast. Um, but along with that, please check out our website, ominous.media. We put our comics on there. That's one of the main things that Noah and I make. And um, they're there for free. So please uh, give, them, give them a little peek and uh, let us know what you think. And that's a nice little rhyme that was unintentional. Um, but along with that, if you like what you see and hear here today, please check out our social media. Please uh, share it with your friends. Um, and also, we have a newsletter that you can sign up for. Um, it's a nice non-spammy way of, of communicating with fans, and you kind of get a heads up of all the stuff that we're working on before we post to traditional um, places. So again, all of that will be in the show notes. Again, we're on social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, all the places. And an exciting thing that I want to let new listeners and also, again, more importantly, just current listeners know um, is that we finally have a YouTube page. It's something that people have been asking for. I didn't want to do it because <laughs> it's a lot of work <laughs> uploading all the things to YouTube and um, I also didn't want them to just be the video, so I had to figure out a way to create like a moving um, timeline or like vocal cord thing. I don't even know how to describe it. But um, if you like listening to podcasts on YouTube, you now can. It's there for you. The link will be in the show description, and we'd appreciate it if you guys um, subscribed. But enough about this, why Ecuadorian. Thank you for your patience. Let's get to the interview uh, with Liam. But once again, to new and old listeners, thank you so much for being here. This is a fantastic interview, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Thanks. Technology is a really good analogy for, <laughs> for human beings and us not being able to get along. Because if you think about <laughs> it, you have like five different manufacturers. Let's take Huawei, Samsung, Android, iPhone. Let's take four of them. Let's throw, let's throw in Razer. Who makes Razer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Motorola. I don't even know. But I mean, each one of those <laughs> companies does something better than the other. You know, they have one thing that they're better at, like 
people with Apple generally like most people like the the OS on an Apple phone more. Most people mm-hmm. like the the functionality and the changeability when it comes to Google more, et cetera, right? And if all those people just came together, took their top team and worked together for a month, we would have literally the greatest phone known to man. <laughs> it would be leaps and bounds ahead of like anything we have now, but we hold ourselves back constantly because, I mean, obviously commerce is in that situation, but yeah. we hold ourselves back constantly from doing things like, you know, getting back into space in a more re- realistic way and, 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 you know, all these kinds of things because we're just stubborn and egotistical, <laughs> you know, like, it's true. and because of that, we have to go searching for 50,000 different options to find how to, you know, record correctly. But, yes, you know, we, <laughs> we all got the same microphone, so we found the same. That's right. The same we thing get there. it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, and that's kind of a difference, I feel like, between certain industries and the art world is that more often than not, and obviously there are exceptions, but in the art world and creative world, you're going to try to associate yourself with people who will help you produce the best work possible. There's less of that kind of, oh, I got to snuff out the the competition. I got to keep my secrets close to my, you know, to my chest. Um, it's more collaborative, I feel like. So, oh, yeah. Maybe that's a, a good side of it. That's true. That's true. We're not all bad. Noah, this yeah, is 2020. Right. Stop trying to be positive. Embrace the darkness. Uh- <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I was just talking to a good friend of mine. And, you know, every day we wake up and something new and terrifying and terrible mm-hmm. has happened. And after last week, I woke, I was talking to my friend. I'm like, I honestly, if I woke up tomorrow and they're like, aliens have landed in Ohio, I would be like, yeah, that's, that's, of course. I wouldn't really be that shocked. Yeah. It'd be, oh, yeah, yeah of, course, of course that happens. They've landed in, in Ohio and they're probing people. They're not peaceful. I'd be like, yep, <laughs> sure. They, they, they picked a good time. <laughs> yeah, we exactly. deserve to be it's probed. Chaos. <laughs> That's we, right. We, do. we absolutely do, yeah. Uh, well, I I don't have a a smooth transition. We record the the like main intro separately. So we'll just kind of jump into it um, with Let's our it. questions and stuff. But the first thing that is just, I have to address and I'm sure old listeners will be annoyed, but it's always really funny to me to spend days researching a guest, looking at other stuff, watching videos to see them digitally and then to then see them digitally on my screen, but then also responding to me. There's like a weird kind of madness <laughs> where I'm like, is this actually happening or am I still watching a YouTube video? We all, we all go through that, man. I, I mean, every time we, we, we play with a band that I'm like a huge fan of, there's always that weird disconnect where you're like, I've watched you for for years and suddenly you're right mm. in front of me. And it's funny too because I don't really have a tendency to get starstruck by people except for a few people in my life and I've always embarrassed myself. Oh. And they, <laughs> a few, like I remember years ago I was at a party and I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Nice. And I had just pounded out the Enterprise series. And there's a guy on there named Connor Trahill or Trenier, Trahill, Trenier. And he plays this character Chip. And I'd watch the whole series. So, you know, when you pound a series, you get really connected to people in the series. Mm, yeah. And I walk into this party and my cellist walks up and who had watched the show with me. And he's like, uh, you need to walk in the other room. I'm like, all right. And I walk in the other room and <laughs> there's Chip. And I didn't know what to say. I was I was in super geek mode. And I walk <laughs> up and I shake his hand. I'm like, you're, you're Trip. And he's like, yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> my name's Connor. Nice to meet you. And I'm like, your trip. And I, I, I just, my brain shut off, you know? So, so yeah, but I, I get you. Yeah. No, I'm one of those people where, yeah, if I, if I see a famous person that I love or if I'm at a convention, I'm just going to look at them from far away and smile. I don't, I know myself. It'll not go well if I walk up to them <laughs> in that moment. Um, which again is why I'm super thankful for this platform where I'm able to you know, actually have one-on-one time and, you know, have a conversation as opposed to in five seconds, try to spurt out everything I've ever thought about that person. It's like, oh. I love you. Oh, I've had dreams about you. Uh, I, I bought things. That, exactly. uh. yeah. yeah, no, I'm with you. I do the same freaking thing. Yeah. But at, at the end of the day, it's funny because then you, you get to know people and you're like, oh my God, we're all just freaking people trying not to die. Yeah. <laughs> yes. true. Trying to just love one another and not die. That's, that's pretty much Very it. Very true. And we're all just kind of winging it. <laughs> yeah, we're all winging it. 
Everybody's swinging it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I'll, I'll say it multiple times throughout the show, but thank you so much again for coming on. We're very excited. And um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, Noah and I, before you hopped on, we're, we're just talking and kind of reminiscing. And um, I forget where I was, but I was driving and um, It Keeps Us Dancing came on my Spotify. And I remember just being like, oh, this is good. And like turning it up and then being like, oh, what, what is this? And the, you know, the kind of orchestral part like boomed in. And I was like, ah, there's tears in my eyes. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Um, and then, you know, showed Noah. And then when we would work on comics together, we'd kind of have these comics nights, uh, where we would just both hunker down and work on our separate things. Noah illustrating me writing. And a lot of your guys's music was in our, our playlist for our comic. And then it would come on and we would sing together and both try and fail to hit the high notes. And it's just (laughs) crazy to us now. Again, we were talking beforehand we're like, we're about to talk to someone that, we really love how how did this happen? <laughs> so we're very excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And that means a lot. I mean, that song means a lot to me. And um, and the high note thing, I love. You know, every every time we play a show, one of the things that I love most about our fan base is that they all love to sing. You know, mm. like I, uh, we have the most like loving fans in the world. So when we have these shows, especially you know, the more people are in a room, the more generally people are willing to sing because they feel yeah. like, you know, in a group of people that are actually doing it. And every time we play these cities, I'll go to sing Brine and or Boat, which is just up there, and people yeah. will go for it. <laughs> and a lot of them will hit it. Some of them won't. But a lot of them will hit it. And it's it's always amazing to me, like people people putting themselves out there in that way, you know. It's but I would I would feel too nervous to do that at a show. You know, and I love it. It's they're amazing. So you guys, you could keep trying, keep hitting it. They'll do it. Also, you guys do comics. Yes, yes. Did one of you do the artwork for the the podcast? Noah does. Yeah, I do the the covers. Yeah, it is it is awesome. Actually, I have a really good friend that's that's actually doing pretty well in comics right now. Frank, have you guys ever heard of Frank Gogol? I have not. He released. I don't think so. He released a comic called Grief a while back that that was a kind of a interesting commentary on like small stories about how people grieve and things mm. they go through. And then he's releasing something called, um, damn it. It's doing really well. It's I'll, I'll remember by the end of the thing and tell you, but, it, awesome. but yeah, I love comics. Yeah, no, send it our way. Uh, we love reading them. Obviously. <laughs> Actually, I got to ask you being comic guys, what did you, what did you think? I'm going to ask you two questions. One, what did you think of the Watchmen HBO series? Mm. Did you watch it? I I no. did. What are your thoughts? I I enjoyed it. Um, I liked that it wasn't just a you know adaptation of the comic because again we kind of got that with Zack Snyder. Didn't need to see that again. So I liked and I love. Is it Damien Lindelof or Damon? I forget his name. Damon. Damon. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan mm-hmm. of his writing. You know, the leftovers. Um, oh right. I still have fond memories of Lost, despite you know everyone talking about how the ending is bad. It's like, I'm like, let's not focus on the negative. It was a good show. Um, no, it was a good yeah. show. But all that to say, um, I liked a lot of things about the show, but I also did find it a little just lacking. And I and I've had a hard time figuring out why. But there's some episodes that I think were masterful and some of the best examples of television. And then there's other things where I just was like, eh. This is kind of pretentious. And if you haven't read the graphic novel, you're probably like, what the hell is happening? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's funny. My my wife hadn't read it. She really enjoyed it. I thought it was an interesting take. There were some things that were a little on the nose where it's like, okay, this is obviously alluding to this piece in our society. Mm. But I, I thought it was... For for being something that you're adapting something from something that's that well known and that good, I thought they did a pretty good job of extending it. You know, even Snyder's version, a lot of people there there's like polar different sides to like what people think oh, about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, for for me, I thought it was spectacular, but mm-hmm. And the, I, the same reason I don't like it is the reason I like it. I love the fact that it's literally like you don't, you either read the comic 
book or, or the graphic novel or you read or you watch the movie because it's yeah. the same exact thing. Yeah, like shot for, for shot. Part, yeah. It's shot for shot. And it's yeah. and to pay that much detail to it, I mean, I thought that was great. But um, but yeah, okay, so second question, then I'll let you guys get into it. Um, as As artists and comic guys, what is your, and if you can't name one, give me your top like three, but what is your favorite comic book adaptation in film or television? Good Ooh. question, Liam. And just the fact that you ask it is making me crush on you harder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Noah's looking behind him. He's like, hmm, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to look at my shelf. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, Man, Watchmen is for sure way up there because I remember, and it's I actually did it the wrong way because when it came out, I watched the movie first and read the graphic novel, and then you know became hugely invested in the world of comics. Um, I don't know if there's a wrong way to do that though because they're well, so similar. Sure. That's that true. It's kind of like in this case, you know, yeah. I, I did the polar opposite. I had literally read the graphic novel and then watched the movie pretty much directly after. Oh, so really? it was just yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed it much more watching it years later mm. because I hadn't just yeah. it was like reading the comic book twice, yeah. you know. Yeah, just getting that fresh take. But man, I remember just like the 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 slow-mo scenes and oh, I, I mean yeah. that was the first big Snyder thing after 300. I'm pretty Which sure. I, I, people talk so much shit on that movie. I love that movie. Oh, it's so great. That, it was so entertaining. Yeah, that's another great, actually, uh, Frank Miller comic yeah. book adaptation um, that I, I enjoyed. But yeah, just the, the stylized, I thought um, like his style worked perfectly for that kind of story for, for both movies. Um, and it just, yeah, the, the fact that it was shot for shot was the most impressive thing for me with Watchmen because I was just like, how do you even... Do that. I mean, I guess like part of your work is done because that's your storyboard is literally <laughs> yeah. you know, that. But then the actual execution of it would be so difficult. It was just yeah. Yeah, when the comedian goes out the window. Yeah, that's the, just that's the scene I'm thinking of. It was just like yeah, it's just crazy, like perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Watchmen. That, that's probably okay. up there for me. Yeah, I think I I think that would probably be the same for me, and I'm the same way too. Where I watched the movie first. Uh, despite my parents not wanting me to, I watched it. <laughs> and then uh, uh-huh. um, I remember we, there was like this uh, Christian website that tells you all the bad things that are in movies. It's called Plugged In. And I remember them being plugged like, in, yep. show us the Plugged In and we'll we'll see. And then we just walked through every <laughs> single section. It's like violence. And I was like, she's like, read it. I'm like, and he, he punches a man through his elbow. It's very gory. And she's like, mm. and then it's like sex. And it's like, <laughs> read it. I'm like, oh, I don't well, want to. <laughs> And the descriptions were always graphic. I'm like, this is worse than watching the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, actually, that's maybe the only thing I didn't like about the movie. I thought it had the most awkward sex scene oh, of any yeah. movie. And maybe maybe it's because the sync, the music sync that they used was kind of strange yeah. to me. It was like very like open and just kind of like, oh. Weird, yeah, it was strange. Know, well, and the thing is, like in the comic, it was like, you know, three frames um, right. three panels, but in the, yeah, in the movie, it just kind of drags on. Cause it's like, well, we've got a yeah. whole, we've got a whole song to play. <laughs> yeah. We got two good looking people. We, and, and that's Hollywood, right. So we got to make them copulate for as yeah. long as possible. <laughs> and honestly, the, the sex scene in Watchmen kind of reminds me of the sex scene in the room to where it's just like, it feels like what a, like a middle schooler thinks of like sex it's just like all right we have the kissing yeah. now we have them gasping it's just like it's just awkwardly like put together like it's just like I, it makes me blush like normally sex scenes don't make me blush but i just blush because <laughs> i'm embarrassed for everyone um the the only other I, I, so i have three other ones but two don't count because i haven't read the comics i just know that they're based off comics so the okay. two that don't count are um road to perdition and a history of violence um Oh, History of Violence. Both of those are based on comics? Yep. I didn't know that. <clears throat> you know what's funny? I literally just watched Road to Perdition oh, that's funny. again two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I recently went down that YouTube rabbit hole of History of Violence because I, had, I hadn't seen it in a long time. And I was I went through the, you know, they do the one yeah. to eight scenes. I'm like, I'll yeah, just- Yeah, I remember that one, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's a great movie. Both, yeah, I, I watch clips from those both like a lot because they just have some really great moments. Um 
But then the the only one I could think of that I actually read and watched both adaptations is Persopolis. Um, I read that, I think, two years, two or three years ago. Um, and that one's kind of similar to Snyder to where it's animated. And so they're able to... Yeah, it's really close. Like, yeah. so closely capture the style. But it's just having the... Getting to hear the actual, you know... Uh, I think it's French that they speak in it. Is it Noah? I forget. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. then the music and it's just the, the animation is beautiful. I understand why it won an Oscar. So that one, they, I think they, you don't necessarily need both because they're so close, but watching both, you have an appreciation right. for its counterpart. I haven't seen that yet. I'll have to watch it. Yeah, it's really good. Check it out. <clears throat> Yeah, you you guys should have actually had had John on this thing, our bass player. He is a encyclopedia when it comes to comic book movies uh-huh. and comic well movies in general, but comic books and movies. And he'll throw out all sorts of weird things where you're, you know the fun fact, blah 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 blah. You're like, what? Yeah, he's well. Hopefully, good. when this freaking pandemic is over and things are a little bit more normal we can see all in person and then we can uh we can ambush him and be like we talked to your friend and now we want to talk about comics (laughs) (laughs) yeah 15 years from now (laughs) that's right (laughs) when the when the dust settles down and the fallout is uh yeah and did you did you say that you had one liam do you have a favorite adaptation yourself oh man oh man that's I shouldn't have asked this question. Um, I know, mm, I mean, Watchmen's up there. Um, hmm. I'm going to have to percolate on that a little bit. I know which one I really was bothered by. I think Hit one us. of my least favorites mm. because I love I love the actual uh, the comic and I wish they'd remake it was um, A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I was not happy with that one. Um, That's a strange movie. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be really basic, though. And even though it's not based on a specific comic, I'm a huge fan of 80s Batman. Mm. Uh, Mm. I just just thought that they captured a, a, a vibe that... You know, when you get into, you know, 90s Batman, it goes way too far into, like, comic books. Yeah. Even though I love Batman forever, yeah. um, it's just so comic booky. Uh-huh. And then you get into the modern ones, which are also excellent. I mean, Heath Ledger and Christian Bale. I even liked Bane, actually. A lot of people talk crap on the last movie, but I actually enjoyed it. Yeah, I liked Bane, too. But, um but yeah, but that was, like, so hyper-realism, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> which I think, I think... I think it's probably because it's a DC comic. You know, DC comics are so based on mysticism, whereas like everything in the uh, Marvel universe is a little more scientific or alien or technological. So you can kind of, you can make it seem a little more believable in the now in some weird ways. Um, And you can make it more fun because of that. Whereas with DC, you almost have to make it into a film. Yeah. And and I think 80s Batman kind of straddled that that world where you have a kind of comic booky feel and the weird corniness of the 80s but you also have a little bit of a grit to it that's kind of you know also kind of the 80s as that's well. a good but, point yeah. i i've always been biased to the the nolan films but yeah that, that definitely i like that perspective on them <clears throat> yeah having a little bit of each is kind of mm-hmm. nice yeah all right. And they feel they feel like the animated show, like in how they portray Gotham. Like um there's just that like skyline feel where you're like each building is massive mm. and like it's dark and like again, Nolan movies are fine, but their Gotham just feels like Chicago, Detroit, or New York. Pitch, that's what because that's what it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. that's where they shot filmed, them. It was filmed right out, or at least some of the scenes were filmed right outside of one of my best friends. Apartments. Oh, in really? Pittsburgh. Yeah, he calls me up. He's like, "There's a Batmobile on my street right now." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty awesome. Um, well, just to quickly lay out for you and our listeners, also, whenever I'm looking down, I'm not not being present. I'm just looking at my notes. <laughs> yeah, um, of course. Anyway, course. Um, some people get offended. Slash, it's never <laughs> happened, but I'm a fearful man, so I always, <laughs> I always want to throw that out there. But um, I'm just going to lay out the structure for, again, you and our listeners of where we're going to go. So first, we're going to start with you, 
just telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, what you make, how long you've been making it, how you like to make it, et cetera. Um, then we'll take a little song break and we can give the people a taste of why uh, Noah and I are in love with you. And then um, after that, Noah and I will launch into our main questions, which will honestly just be us fangirling. But Noah, that's not really so much different from any other that's time. Right. We always fangirl. It's in our, it's in our nature. Uh, it's like the scorpion and the frog. You know, it's like someone asks us to take them across a river and then they're like, don't you fangirl on us though? And we're like, okay. And then midway across the river, we fangirl them. <laughs> they ask us why. And we say it's in our nature. Wow, that was really dumb. Anyway, and, <laughs> and fi- Noah's, Noah's cringing so hard right now. And finally, we'll end with our rapid fire segment, which is where we'll ask quick and silly questions that'll more than likely make you rethink your decision to be on, your, on our show. <laughs> um, all right, all right. <clears throat> Does that sound okay, Liam? Sounds good to me. Noah, do you still want to be my co-host after nope. all that? That was nice talking to you guys. Okay. I just want to get the comic right, cool. talk in there and then that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was that was it. Rap, Noah's fulfilled. Done. Uh well let's yeah, let's start off by getting to know you, Liam. Uh tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and uh what you do. Well, uh my name is Liam. Obviously, uh, I grew up in an area of California called Calaveras County, which is uh, about three and a half, four hours from San Francisco. Um, the easiest way to find it is it's kind of like r- the butt crack right in between Sacramento and <laughs> Reno. It's like right at the base of the Sierra Nevadas, um, extremely rural. Uh, I think uh, like my town, we had the closest gas station to me was about 15 miles away and yeah and uh, my high school had i think my high school graduating class had like i want to say 90 something to maybe 100 Mm -hmm. kids i mean it wasn't a big school um and so you know growing up out there there are a few things that are interesting you know a it's rural so i I was one of like i think four asians in my school Mm, yeah Mm. and my sister was one of the other ones and we're both half so we kind of made one (laughs) you counted as one uh (laughs) we counted we counted as one asian and uh and then you have uh you're in, in open spaces so you're you're generally always a little different and there's not a lot to do and i think that kind of helped breed um oh hello dog I think that generally helped breed uh, creativity. And I was really lucky, you know. I mean, obviously, rural America is a very conservative region uh-huh. generally. And the the area that I grew up in, there was a little pocket of um, liberal um, ideology that I was kind of raised in. And that, that crew was extremely supportive of, you know, each other. And so that kind of lifted me up musically. Um, but yeah, I grew up just kind of hiking and you know, shearing sheep and doing things <laughs> wow. like that. Did you say and shearing then, sheep? Yeah, we had sheep. We had sheep for a while. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and it's it's a really beautiful area. So it was really it's it's really you know it's one of those things you go home, you you want to leave a rural area as soon as you're yep. old enough. You're like I got to get out of here, and then you leave, and then you go back two years later, and you're like, oh, it's yes. so beautiful. I could live <laughs> here, and then you're like, eh, could I live here? Um, but yeah, I, I did a little music in high school. Um, I didn't start until probably I did a little singing when I was really young. Did some like talent show mm-hmm. kind of things, <clears throat> but um, I didn't join up with any kind of choir or anything until high school, and then um, started. I taught myself how to play guitar when I was, I think, a sophomore. And, uh, yeah, and just decided I wanted to do music. And so I went to school for opera uh, because that was, you know, if you're a singer, you don't really have too many options. Um, (laughs) And I went to a school that had a jazz program that they were developing and partially because they gave me a scholarship um, for that program. But, But it was a situation where... Towards the end of the year, it, it was very clear that like they had the right intentions, but they just didn't have the the facility to do mm. it, you know. So, so I ended up leaving and moving to San Francisco, um, mostly because I wanted to be here. Um, I always kind of loved it here. Uh, I, you know, Calaveras County is pretty. We have seasons there, San Francisco. We don't have <laughs> seasons. Uh, it's all. It's you know. It's weird here actually, and climate change has gotten even more strange. It used to be foggy and now it's pretty much always mm. beautiful. 
and sunny. And I'm literally the only person that would complain about that because I moved here for the fog <laughs> and for the cold. Um, and, and I got out here and I was, I was in college and I just didn't, I realized I was putting so much time into music outside of school that it was a waste for me to be like monetarily speaking, mainly a waste for mm-hmm. me to be in school at that moment. And that was a scary decision. And I was really lucky because I had parents that were like extremely supportive of it. Um, and it took a while. I, I, I played in a few bands and I wrote some music and I think right at around 2005, you know, I think a lot of artists are always trying to find their sound yeah. Like what they write. And sometimes and some people can do it right off the bat. I mean, there's some kids nowadays that are writing music that are in high school that are just brilliant. There's a kid named Declan McKenna in Europe. If you've if you've never heard of him, you should check him out just because he's I think his first album was released when he was 15 and it's really good and kind of I, it's you're like, how are you writing these lyrics yeah. at 15? One of those. <laughs> Uh, and it took me a while because I was listening. You know, if you listen to the Family Crest, which I know you two do, it, it's there's a lot of mm. different genres. And I I've always had like a really wide berth in terms of my like taste in music. I just like things that are good and things that are interesting. And and at the early stages of my writing, I feel were trying really hard to smash things together that didn't work. So I was listening, 2005 was like the, in my opinion, like kind of the pinnacle of, at that point they called it indie music. I mean, we still say indie, but it was a different thing. It was Saddle Creek, you know, Cursive and Rilo Kiley and Bright Eyes and uh, very angsty, uh, angular music. And then you had the poppier, jazzier stuff like John Mayer Mm -hmm. and Jason Mraz and all these people, Jason Mraz pre-MTV that were doing really, really beautiful cordage and um, really beautiful songwriting, but a little more on the like pop side of things. And so I was trying to smash the lyricism <laughs> of, of this indie music with this like open major chord sound of this pop music, which didn't really work. And, <laughs> and it took me a while to realize um, that, that, you know, to find my sound and through... A few artists, there's one named Sandra Lerke, who's a Norwegian um, artist that kind of takes jazz and 60s sounding music, especially in his early records, and puts it together. And I remember hearing him, and I found him and Damien mm. Rice and another artist named Tater around the same moment. And But he was the one that kind of stood out to me because I was like, oh, you can make a kind of jazz sound in popular music or, or in indie or rock. And it really informed, you know, what I listened to. And and it took a while. And then uh, I was in a, another band with our bass player, John. And we, we had kind of gone down a path where the music had taken this turn into trying to make it. And I, I'm not going to speak for everyone that was in that band, but on my end, I felt like I felt like we were trying really hard to make it, and and they wanted h- hits. You know, we wanted to write these hits at the expense of taking the time to write something that like I could stand behind. Mm-hmm. And it made me really jaded, really fast. And so John and I decided we were going to leave the band after a while. And um, before we had decided that, we I, we went on a a trip to Europe. I was out there for about a month and a half and John joined me about halfway through. And while I was out there, I was listening to all these old recordings that I'd done. Um, when I write music, I tend to, once I have an idea of what the chorus and the verse are for the song, I'll basically set out a recording device and I'll play through the whole song and I will sing whatever lyrics come into my head and I will, you know, allow it to kind of Mm. make itself uh, and not kind of force myself into like, oh, I'm going to write a chorus here and a verse here. And then, you know, Um, and a lot of times I use the lyrics that I sang in the song that are, then they'll be just kind of tweaked because for me, if I write lyrics later and I'm happy and I wrote a melody and I was, or a song that I was really sad, there's this kind of weird juxtaposition that doesn't work. And so I was kind of going through all of these songs that I'd written over these years on this long trip and ended up 
you know, pulling a few out, which kind of informed a few songs I was writing. And when John got to Ireland, I played him, uh, I believe the first song I played him was North and then the bells. And he was like, we should, Mm. we should record this. And at the point that we had decided to, we kind of got to this point that we were both kind of jaded and we were thinking about just doing like normal things, you know, we always joke, well, we should, we would have just become tax lawyers or something, which <laughs> we could never do because we're both terrible <laughs> math. Um, but so we decided let's make a record that we're proud of so that when we're, you know, in our late thirties or whenever, and we have kids, we can, Oh, what do you do in your twenties? Oh, we made mm. this thing that we're proud of. And so I started writing it and it was like the first time that I'd ever tried diving into orchestration, but I'd been listening to a lot of Arcade Fire at that time and the Decemberists and obviously Cursive and Damien Rice, who both use a lot of yeah. textures. And um, and I also have loved, I've always loved just collaborating with people like on a performance scale more than anything. You know, like there's always something that you can learn from someone. And I think that can be said about everything, like completely outside of music. You know, if you're listening to people, everyone has some place that they've been and something that they can bring to the table. And so I was like, well, let's just see how many people want to collaborate. And so we sent out a bunch of messages and talked to a few people and said, you know, if you have any friends that want to do this, let me know. And we thought we'd get like five people. And we ended up with, I think about a hundred and about a hundred on the Mm. first record. Wow. And, you know, through that, I learned to compose music like, and to orchestrate because, you know, because I went into it with absolutely no ego, at least in that regard from the compositional side, you know, if I'm working with kids that are, you know, fourth year conservatory students or grad students that have been playing their instruments Mm. since they were 10 and I'm just writing a violin line for the first time, obviously if they have something to add to the conversation, I'm going to be like, please tell me how to do this thing. And, um, and so over the next few years, the extended family, I mean, it was, it kept growing and we kept meeting these amazing people. And I kind of came to this decision that the easiest and best way to learn how to do what I wanted to do and grow in the band as a composer was to just talk to these people and like take them out to coffee and pick their brain. Um, because I was also watching the conservatory through them and seeing how people were writing and hearing the various complaints about composers and how when you start using a technology like Finale or Sibelius, which is a composition mm-hmm. like scoring um, software, while it's, I mean, that's, I use Finale and while it's a great tool, if you're not thinking about the actual instrumentalist that's playing it, and if you're not thinking about the range of the instrument and how, how a musician enjoys playing their music and you're just worried about making something that's either like uh, like so avant-garde that it's different, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, it, there's this strive to be like different and unique. And and I feel like you end up losing some of the beauty there and you also end up pissing off whoever you're yeah. <laughs> asking to play your music because, the, you know, it's like, well, I could go this high technically on a trombone, but it would be more suited to mm-hmm. swap it to a different instrument. And so through like talking to the extended family, I, I just learned a lot about the various instruments I was writing for and and also learned a lot about classical music. I mean, I didn't know anything about classical music for the most part until maybe eight months mm-hmm. into the family crest. Uh, you know, I'd grown up again in this rural area where I'd never seen a cello until college. And... <clears throat> You know, I knew what these things were, but classical music, I think, to most people, um, they think of it as like, when you say classical, it represents the entire genre. But classical music's a lot like, you know, jazz or really anything else, pop music even, where there's so many different styles embedded within it and eras and... um, And, you know, being able to kind of learn all of these things at one time, also from just a lot of young excited people, I think that was the big thing because you're learning it from your peers. Mm. You're not learning it from a teacher uh, that is kind of an authority figure. And you're not being told. I think one of the biggest problems in um, 
at least in the schooling that I received um, when it came to composition and a lot of the problem that I hear from a lot of people is it's a writing music is approached with with a set of rules and what the teacher is trying to do is give you a toolbox they're trying to give you all of these these different elements from different eras and different composers that you can use to make one cohesive thing but if you don't describe it that way if you just say these are the rules then you're going to end up with people yeah. writing the same song and the same piece because they don't realize you know well the goal here is to write a you know a piece that sounds like a you know a Bach fugue uh so that if you're writing something and you happen to fall into this line you have that tool in your memory that you can go back to and understand what he did what worked you know in this regard and a lot of people don't think of it that way and they end up just getting really discouraged because and, and I think it pushes people to start writing and push against the grain of writing more avant-garde things focusing less on melody um so yeah so for me it was just maybe it wouldn't work for everybody but for me it was the the right way to learn how to write and um and you know with the extended family we eventually <laughs> I, I asked uh maybe like eight months after we'd recorded a bunch of stuff they were asking us mm -hmm. when are we going to see this live and again it was a recording project for john and i so we were like all right who wants to <laughs> join a band and we got some takers and we decided early on that we wanted to make sure that that we kept it fun and that people didn't feel um i mean you want to there is a sense of sense of responsibility when you do anything so you don't want somebody that just is willy-nilly going to like leave a project and not think about the responsibility that comes with how long you've been in the project but you also don't want somebody to feel like they're locked in and and be afraid and can't leave yeah. um and pursue something else because people grow and people people need that and and so we were like all right well we're just going to keep this as open-ended as possible and and it's really suited us well because we've again you every time you play with someone new you get a different flair you get a different vibe um and we try to keep ourselves on our toes by again every we kept the extended family going so now we're in the god i don't even know how many we have something like 800 people oh, wow. that we've collaborated oh my with gosh now, something like that yeah and 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 so from the recording side you just meet some of my best friends that I've met in my entire life or ex were extended family. My, my wife, I met through the band, uh, you know, a lot of the, the people in the band and a lot of extended family members that are now mm. dating, things like that. And, um, and it also, you know, we do it live as well. We try to invite people to come play live shows, which is for us just, you know, it's amazing. Cause you, you know, when you're a band, you're on the road, you're playing the same songs over and over and over again. And the only difference, the, the thing that makes it unique and special is the audience. But when you add another person on stage that is either nervous about it or um, even if they're really good, they're just like they're going with the changes in it. You know, coming from a jazz background, it gives it that feeling of, of improvisation and um, mm, yeah. a different energy, I guess. And, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just the most fun group to be involved in for, for those reasons mm. and many more. But yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, again, like our fans are just the, the, literally the nicest people I've ever met in my life. I honestly, I'm, I'm always shocked when I meet people and I'm just like, how are you stupid? that nice and awesome and cool and we, we are we are pretty nice you guys are pretty dope <laughs> i was thinking it i don't want to backtrack too much but i really like what you were saying about uh the the rules versus tools kind of thing um i feel like that's how you end up with a lot of music that's really formulaic if you're really focused on the commercial aspect of things um, you know, the top 40 stuff and some of it is really good, but a lot of it is, oh, these are the rules to make a successful pop song. I hit those marks. We'll put you on the radio. It'll get, you know, a lot of plays and then that'll be it. Um, whereas the, I like the, the idea of having kind of an arsenal of, of, of tools to, to kind of mess with. I mean, if you think back at any great, great band that you can think of, the reason they became so timeless and, and successful is because they 
broke the rules. They had the tools, you know, that they were given. And then they're like, I I can use this and and do something different. You know, it's interesting because I go back and forth with, I think as you get older, you, you, (laughs) you become less judgmental Mm -hmm. and, you know, I've always been just, I'm the worst person to listen to music with just because I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm kind of ADD and I'm also extremely judgmental, like right at the start of things. Uh And I need to find things my own way. Um, I'm like one of the things that I was talking to our videographer uh, who does the majority of our videos, who's one of my best friends named Kara. And we were talking about the fact that there's, there's two kinds of people. There's the people that you know, you hear there's an amazing television show and you watch it and you're like, yeah, that's amazing. Mm. And then there's the people that you hear there's an amazing television show and on a completely subconscious level, you're like, you understand that it's amazing in all probability, but there's something off-putting about the fact that everyone's saying that it's awesome that yep. you don't watch it right away <laughs> and you're five years behind everybody. And yeah. that's always been kind of a constant battle with me. Um I don't know why Mm. Uh, it's kind of, I think it's, I personally think it's a little gross because I think it, it involves some kind of ego mechanism. Mm. Um, but again, like once you learn the way that you are, you can change the way that you are. And I've had in quarantine, actually, I've had a lot of things that have changed the way that I look at music and styles that I kind of poo pooed earlier. Mm. Um, I've been doing these, bi-weekly cover series for people where it's like I'll do a, a eight songs from the 80s and I'll try to reimagine them. Mm. And the last two that I did were I did the 80s and I did 90s pop. 90s pop to early 2000s pop. And I remember being very much on the on the wagon of 90s pop is just drivel and like (laughs) it's it's the same song over and over again and to an extent it's pop music so it's going to have a much more similar sound to other pop songs right but when i really delved into it and i looked at the lyricism in some of these songs and i looked at the the chord structure and the melodies of some of these songs i was kind of blown away by how good these tracks were, mm. you know, and and the interesting decisions that the producers were making to make it sound, I think there is an art form in making it sound relevant to a genre, yeah. like on a more specific base, but you also, like you're saying, you want to offset it a little bit. Yeah. So if you listen to something like Britney Spears' Toxic, <laughs> that song is actually really really good it's so good (laughs) it's so good but it's one of those things that like if you're listening to it solely on the pop basis yeah um you might blow through Mm. it and same thing with the 80s i was never a fan of 80s music and when i did this this series i i realized there was a lot of substance in the songwriting of the 80s as a whole um and It's also interesting to see, you know, the 80s to me was like an era of excess in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think egotistical excess, you know, and and obvious excess. It's kind of like the 80s bully was always just so overdone. Yeah. Like you think like, you think like, <laughs> like I, I don't know if this is a, ni- I think it's a 90s film, but this is a good, you know, or like Biff Tannen. Yeah. Biff Tanner? Tannen? Biff. Biff. Biff is Back so overdone. Yeah. But he's, but that's what it was. It's perfect for that character yeah. in that style of film, right? Um, the same thing can be said about music. I think there was this weird thing where people, if you wrote a song the way they did now, it would feel overwritten. Mm. You it, you don't need to have this extra verse here. Yeah, um, It's not really adding anything to the song if you listen to it on first glance. Mm. Um, and, and there are some songs that I'm like, yeah, you didn't really need to have that. It, it's just an added thing that you wanted to put in because you felt like, well, fuck it. I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. But that kind of sets it apart in a genre that it's, it's in and of itself. Oh, it's, yeah, that's the eighties. Mm. I could read the lyrics and go, that was probably written in the eighties. <laughs> um, we hear that, that but, snare hit. It's yeah, always the, exactly. the snare. <laughs> but I do think, I do think, you know, as you, as you kind of go through the different things, there's something that you can take from everything. And I think there's this line that 
alluding or you know going back to batman you know there's a line where you can go way too far over Mm. Uh, there's plenty of artists that i listen to that i'm like this is the same exact song as this other song tonally in terms of the chord structure in terms of the lyrics the content it's the same song um and you either know it and you just don't care and your your goal is to just either be famous or or make money mm-hmm. or you don't know it which means that i mean come on like if you don't know it should you be doing yeah. it and <laughs> and and i think that there is a line where people do that sometimes and i think that is when music hits jumps out of that that mid zone and goes farther farther into commerce mm. um but then there, and, and you can go the opposite direction as well, where you're trying to make something that's too different. Yeah, you're trying too sure. hard to be, to be avant-garde and make yourself like, this is who I am, you know? And I think, you know, if you can find that middle ground, that's where you find the best music. And if you can find the people that can do it well, it's just mind boggling, yeah. you know, cause it's hidden. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, it's funny. Uh, one artist recently that I was like, and I, I'm, tr- I'm I'm the same way. I'm trying to get better about this. My early 20s were really bad with me trying to be a contrarian about everything. And it's like, well, if everyone likes it, I'm going to find something wrong with it. Um, yeah, you sucked back then. <laughs> that's just true. I'm um, just joking. <laughs> and uh, but one, one artist in the last few years for me was uh, Billie Eilish, where I was like, I'm not, oh, that's, dude. it's not going to be my thing. I'm not going to like it. And then I tried it one time. And I was just like, I could not get enough of Billie Eilish. And I was like, how young is this girl? I just don't (laughs) understand it. And just her and her brother, just like the the production, the songwriting, I was just like, all right, I'm, I, I need to shut my mouth. That's, that is like the perfect, that's the perfect example because I'm, I did the same exact thing. I heard about, (laughs) I, I saw Billie Eilish on something and I was like, you know, totally judged a book by its cover. I'm yep. like, oh, give me a break. Like she, yep. she was, it was, I remember it was an interview where they asked her if she smoked and she's like, no, I have to, I sing. And I was like, mm. really, really? <laughs> and then I, I don't remember, I remember I watched, um, oh God, it was, I watched some music video that she did and was like, oh, that's actually like. The it was I mean her voice was great, but it was the chords that got me going. Mm-hmm. I think it was um, what's the one that's do it? Is that da, bad guy? Da, uh, bad guy. Yeah. When they go into those crazy like chords on the second half of the verse, yeah, I was like, oh, this is actually like this is some straight up jazz chordage going on here. Yeah, and then really and then I watched her sing "I Love You" and was like, this girl's. I still think I think Billie Eilish probably has she's probably one of the best vocalists i've ever heard in my life like period. really wow. i i think so i think she's astonishingly talented yeah and and then i watched a video on phineas who was mm-hmm. talking he broke down the production and i was yeah. just like you're a genius you know yeah. and these are these young kids and he's literally describing like yeah he, he's talking about it uh, i mean i'm making a pop song but i needed to make it a little different i did this and this and this uh-huh. and and uh, things that i never would have thought of doing that you know i can add to my toolbox from watching that you know but yeah, yeah. he's th- they are the perfect example of just doing it the right way you know well and with you know obviously now with technology and everything the the tools are pretty much infinite, but they don't really use that many tools. It's just they're really creative with how they use them. Um, yeah, when they, yeah, exactly. I mean, they do a lot of like recording and then slight shifting. I mean, they, they do a mm-hmm. lot of like cutting, yeah. but I don't, I don't think, you know, a lot of people are like really against, against, you know, software. And I think, I think software is like anything. I mean, it's just like the internet, you know, like yeah. if you use the internet properly, it's a great resource. It's a great tool. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you know, it's very easy to use it improperly. And a lot of people do. Um, yeah. Same thing with social media, you know, like on, on if you look at it at face value, you're like, oh, Facebook, I can talk to all my friends. I can reconnect with people I haven't talked to in years. Mm-hmm. But then you go down, you have people getting in flame wars that are arguing based on their ego more than anything else. They want to prove you wrong. They wouldn't do that in person. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think, yeah, with recording software, it's the same thing. Um, I found out that, that years ago, auto tune originally was created 
to be used for passing notes. So if you're singing something like, I don't know, like, uh, uh, what's, uh, let's see, uh, there's a wreckage here, mm-hmm. right? If mm-hmm. I sing that line, but uh-huh. if I go, there's a wreckage here, right? And I hit that, there's a, uh, if I yeah. hit the, the uh, a little bit flat, but the rest of my performance was perfect. Yeah. The original it'll, intent it'll of bring it up. That was, the original intent was spot correcting. It's like, oh, well, his passing tone was off here. We can just adjust that. And that yeah. whole take is perfect. Yeah, you don't have to re-record. And then yeah. over time, people started using it like on a, on a blanket scale where they just mm-hmm. throw it on top of everything. And the weirdest thing that I've heard recently, um, the guy that mixes our records, Jay Polici, who's just, I mean, he's brilliant. We give him literally hundreds of tracks and he makes it sound like an orchestra's in a room. Mm. Um, mm. And... I asked him, what's the weirdest thing that's happened in, in production recently? And he said, because of the extreme usage of autotune um, in modern music, people like young kids are starting to sing with voices that sound like they have autotune. Yeah, that that's don't. true. Oh, what? No, so that like is auto- that's weird. That's <laughs> like thing. if you listen to autotune, <laughs> people, when you listen to a track that's autotuned, the end of a vibrato or like passing tones have this kind of, it sounds like vibrato, but it's a little bit more watery. I don't know mm-hmm. how to explain it. It just sounds like it's kind of like gurgly. Yep. And I don't know how to make that sound with my my body, but mm-hmm. all these young kids naturally do it. Yeah. And it's really hard to distinguish what is and is not in t- being used with autotune anymore. I think, and, and the, yeah. yeah. The weirdest thing is when they're putting autotune on people that just don't need it. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like, there's no reason that, you know, I don't know. There's plenty of like m- people that don't need it that just throw it on because they're th- they're forced to, you know, by yes. their production company, you know. Yeah. But yeah, technology's weird in that way. I think we just we overuse it and we we take that easy road. Yeah. Um, I agree, you know. I think it's also cuz it's so competitive too. Guys, I'm still thinking about that. Right? Oh, that's some Black Mirror stuff. <laughs> you broke my brain. <laughs> it's like some weird evolutionary draft getting taller to get the fruit crap where <laughs> voices are becoming more <laughs> autotune like. I, I don't like it. It's super <laughs> that's freaking weird, me man. out. I mean, it just makes me wonder what's next in the game. Uh, you know, well, like but what are- there, there are people, uh, even uh, I remember listening to Ellie Goulding one day. And she always had that mm. signature, like, super auto-tuned voice and all that stuff. And then I watched a live video of her. I'm like, she sounds exactly the same. I'm, I think that's her voice. And then yeah. all these new artists, uh, especially female, I think they just have that timbre in their voice that just, like, there's something about it. But it sounds like it's been processed, but they sing exactly the same live. And I'm like, that must be the new sound that that they're going for. That's pretty crazy. I, I- I think it has to do with with range and and do you guys know what the passaggio is? It's it's the not spot enough in between, to talk about it. <laughs> it's the spot in between your chest voice and your head voice. Oh so yeah, yeah. If, yeah. I'm, if I'm singing here and then I'm singing here, same note but head voice. So I could go. I don't know if I could do it right now. Uh, uh, that's too low. It's like the mix, uh, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's basically it's the mix tone. Yeah, and and I think in pop music and modern music specifically where people would need to use um, autotune for men is generally in that passaggio range. Mm, and I yep. think I think women are right in that range, so they don't have to use it as much. That's and a so good point. They, they affect their, their vibrato a lot more because mm. that's where you really hear it. But yep. yeah, it's, it's so weird. I had the same reaction when I heard, um, oh God, what is her name? Um, oh my God, she dated... Oh God! Uh, I can't. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Never mind. Why are you trying to make up a fake story? I right know. Now? I know. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think I think a lot of I think a lot of this just comes down to the fact that it's just the music industry has changed so much in my lifetime alone, um, and it's become. I think there's two reasons it's become so competitive. Um, I mean, I think, you know, obviously it's always been competitive. Any, any Mm -hmm. entertainment industry is going to be competitive, but I think that when you take shows like America's Got Talent and The Voice and things like that, um, it becomes 
a competition. Mm-hmm. And it be and and the focus on those shows to me seems to be more on the, kind of the vocal gymnastics that people yeah. do. You know, so like using trills constantly and all mm-hmm. these things. Uh, and and I would never take away from any of these singers because I mean there are some amazing singers on these shows. But you end up lifting that bar into this range of like, okay, well, you listen to Frank Sinatra, he's never trilling. He's singing lyrics directly to yeah, you. Straight, yeah. And so the focus becomes less on the music from the lyrical perspective, more on the focus on the the extreme skill perspective. And then when you make music free, you know, it becomes hyper competitive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, if I wanted to, I mean, I remember very clearly, like I loved the song Paranoid Android. Mm. I wanted to hear it and I had to buy an album yeah. to get it. Yeah. And because I bought the album, I I was able to listen, you know, you 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 just spent 10 bucks of your hard-earned money on this. You're going to listen to the whole thing over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I mean, at that era, most people, like singles culture was a different thing. Most people's favorite songs from from their records that they listened to when they were kids when they had to buy CDs are not the hits. Yeah, it's like that's true. it's a personal decision based on like what you were going through when you heard that song and when it struck you. I don't think that exists as much anymore. Mm-hmm. I think people generally are kind of like glommed onto the singles because it's much cheaper to release singles. Yeah. Um, the, the, the idea of releasing full albums is, is sl- it seems to be slowly and slowly dissipating. Uh, and I think that has more to do than anything with money. Um, yeah. And, and just the fact that, you know, that single before was a $10 single. Now it, and then it moved to a $1 single and now it's free. Well, now it's, you know? it seems like one thing I've noticed a lot is um, bands or artists will release pretty much the whole album in singles leading up to the album. I think just cause that's the way streaming works and that's the way to get people to pay attention to it. Cause I think you're right. Like very few people sit down and listen to a whole album all the way through. That's kind of getting lost. Yeah, it, it, it's also interesting too, because, and I, I noticed this with Netflix, you know, if you, if you're paying for Netflix or Spotify, you are doing it, you're not doing it, most people are not doing it every month. I mean, they are, but they're not sitting down and pressing, I'm paying for this. Yeah. It's being charged to their credit card. Yeah. And because of that, it's in the back end of your mind. Mm-hmm. So you're not thinking about this as a purchase. You're thinking about it as this is, it's free. And 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 because of that, you you don't think about it in terms of, you, you valueize it differently, Yeah, you know? And yeah, and so I don't know. I think it's it's just an interesting thing that like so many people have it's gotten to the point that the value of music has dropped mm. uh not only monetarily but i think just in terms of like what pe- what it really means to people you know like my wife's always saying like imagine if for one day every piece like every piece of art that you like have in your life like all of the songs all of the television shows it was black for a day you can't listen to music you can't pick up you know it's just gone yeah like what would what would that be like what would life be like and i think you know we're just so used to it being free Mm. you know and it's it's weird it's it's kind of changed the game and so because of all that competition you just have people really leaning into the technology because they got to think get it done fast and 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 get it out there and they can't spend as much time really um, thinking about it. Well, you know? And so, yeah, songs are getting shorter too, especially pop music. Um, yeah. yeah, some of it, yeah, it's true. It's a, all about the, the attention span. But that being said, you know, to play devil's advocate, then you have people like Billie Eilish who, and plenty of other artists that are just making brilliant music that have, with this technology and with the music that's being created, had the ability to hear, I mean, the the other side of of the internet and free music is that you have access to so much yeah. that you didn't before. Mm-hmm. You know, so many things. You know, one of my favorite my favorite guitarists that I've ever seen is a guy named Matteo Sasato. He's on Instagram. Mm. This guy is unreal. Like, I'm not a dude that like sits and watch people shred. Mm-hmm. He's the most tasteful guitarist I've ever seen. He is famous because he was just releasing, you know, a video a day of him doing licks on on Instagram. He made a career out of it. But that dude is 
embedded in my brain his style in terms of the way he solos is is now embedding itself in some of the like scatting that I do and and things like that and it's changed me artistically mm. and that wouldn't have been there without you know this this shift in music yeah. so it's a it's a weird time you know cuz both things are equally you know negative and positive yeah. i guess you guys are going to find that I'm extremely long-winded, so just no, I you know, love bear it. with me. I'm eating it up. I was going to say, not that you're long-winded, but my brain, because of both you and Noah, is just overwhelmed. There's like so many different things that I found, I found delicious in that conversation and wanted to chime in on. But then I was like, <laughs> shut your mouth, Kyle, and just listen and enjoy it. You're going to have to listen to it again anyway. So, That's true. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain from reacting to everything you said because... Listeners don't need to hear my my thoughts on that because I got plenty of other ones. But the quick things that I will say is, A, I'm still thinking about the autotune children <laughs> freaking me out. <laughs> the Second, autotune children. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the title of our next comic. Um, That's right. But, uh, and the second just quick thing um, is, and this is going really far back. Again, I'm, I'm sorry. But I just am very happy, Liam, to have a fellow jazz lover because we had an episode here a while back, whereas Noah, I, and our mixer, um, who mixes our podcast and also does music himself, and uh, I was the only jazz lover, and they poo-pooed on me, and it was not kind, it was not friendly. I poo-pooed and, on you because uh, you poo-pooed on country music right before that. So I didn't poo-poo on country. Yeah, you did. I said I didn't like country music no, you, for you the most part. I didn't say country music's bad. We're not going to get into this. Let's not fight in front of <laughs> Liam. But, <laughs> but all I have to say... Um, I am glad to have a fellow jazz lover, and I want to thank you because today I was listening to your guys' podcast, which is, um, what is it? It's called Band Together, Band Comma Together, right? Band Together. Band Together, Um, And you, let me see, you mentioned the name earlier, uh, Sondre Lurchel, is that how you say it? Or Lurche? Sondre Lurche. Lurche. Sondre Lurche, okay. Um, You mentioned him, and as soon as you said similar to Chet Baker, I was like, I'm going to pause this podcast and I'm going to listen to that man. And I was not disappointed. Very tasty. So thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. He's he's amazing. Um, there's a lot of people that are making making really, I mean, jazz is kind of making a slow comeback and filtering its way in. I mean, there's, there's another guy. Um, oh, man, I don't have my phone in front of me because it's recording right now, so I can't tell you <laughs> what his name is. Uh, Jordan... Jordan Rakai, Jordan Rakai, and mm. his his recordings are great. But if you want to be just utterly blown away by a live performance, check out his tiny desk mm. because okay. it's like it's unreal. Uh, he's he's just tasteful and kind of jazzy and R and B. And of course, he's from New Zealand because I guess there's something in the water and everybody there is musically talented. Yeah. But <laughs> New Zealand and Ireland, um, yeah. I feel like so. yeah, right, and and Sweden yeah. for pop music. <laughs> Um, again, I, my brain's still going, I know you said that you're not going to react to all the amazing things they said, but you really should, but no brain, I'm not going to. So moving forward, (laughs) um, I want to take the metaphorical reins of this conversation and steer this horse back to you, Liam. Um, Okay, let's do it. We've been talking about your music. Again, we mentioned, uh, the song that Noah and I first heard of yours. It keeps us dancing. So I say we take a quick song break and have the people listen to this beautifulness and then we'll come back and we'll get into the nitty gritty of it. There's a wreckage here It lines the coast There's a heartbeat Like a ghost Moving slowly through its frame There's a silence, a sad refrain Where you're going is where I've been Where your heart leads, it's not the end Like a fire You'll grow and grow And it keeps us moving Oh, it keeps us dancing Oh, my past love. 
is harsh and thick But still you come back around here To pull me up from the sticks And through his memories of love in vain We keep on moving my ever loving girl here's to the heart on my sleeve a piece of fuse a piece of 